So weekend went pretty good. Um, we had, uh, I think, three people total that showed up. Um, that's kind of how the hackathon went. Um, totally wish you could have more of you. Um, but kind of talking about the agenda here today, um, I want to talk about, um, I've got a few things on my agenda. I want to give the, the kind of the crew that, that worked on the project this weekend a chance to, to demo it so they can kind of show you uh, what they built it what they built. Um, I want to talk with you about a few more kind of React related topics. Um, so little net nuggets as far as things that we haven't really touched on. Um, so I need to kind of mention a few of those and a handful of those. Um, and then today I want to kind of introduce you to SaaS. That's one of the things I want to get you started with is how do you SaaS and how do you make your, your, your pages look a whole lot better using SaaS and using Bootstrap and, and the kind of combination of those things. So we'll talk a little bit about some topics there. Um, I'll kind of open the floor for some additional questions if you have them. And then we're going to kind of walk through and do a little bit of playing around with SaaS today. Cool. Um, for kind of the remainder of the semester, you just have one lab remaining. Six four, right? So I've started to kind of sketch an out. I sketch an outline that's up there on Inside Raken. Should you want to look at it, and basically it's a matter of a fleshing out some of the features that you've kind of started, and, and I think some of you have already started some of the features that weren't on six three, but are on six four. So some of those you may or may not have done already. But it's kind of a continuation with the project. So they're just kind of tidying those things up, as well as then doing some styling, which we're going to talk about today. Cool. So that's kind of what we're doing. So today I'm going to do some lecture stuff. The rest of the week, um, you're going to have open lab time for 64, and, and basically this lab, this last lab, is that do back on the uh, We've got one more hand on desk plan um, up here on the 13th, and that's kind of it. Um, I do want to do um, ever give everybody a chance to present and show off your bug tracker at the end of the semester. Um, so the plan is to do that on the last day of class, the 16th, and we'll kind of start setting that up on the 14th of getting the uh, slide deck together, trying to report some presentations, and then, and then showing them on the 16th. So that will be other kind of things that will be happening next week. So yeah. when, when was the lab due? Was it due that Friday? So it'll be this, this Wednesday. So we can work on it until then? Yeah. Yeah, we'll have time to work on it through that. Just recognize there's going to be a few other things going on next week. Um, so, you know, plan for not having all of the time necessarily to go to that because there's some other there's some other work that we'll do next week. Cool. Okay. So, um, I'm going to share in Discord my notes so you can have them up. Oh, a little snow on there. Yeah. Um, so you should have a link to my notes for today. And if you would, um, can I get Don and uh, Evan? Can I get you guys to come up here? So, um, just this weekend, you know, we had a hackathon. We had three participants. So. Evan, Evan from our class, Don from our class, and, and Zach. Um, so you can see some pictures from, from them kind of working this weekend, and there's more out there. You know, if you look on the Discord channel, there's a hackathon channel, and I posted a few different pictures um, from that. But what I want to do is give you a chance to kind of show off um, what you guys built. So let's see if I can open it up. Rankin W and G, React. There you go. And I'll let you demo from there. Go ahead, Tom. Turn the lights on there. So tell them about what, what you were doing this weekend and then why you were doing it. Yeah, so we were given the opportunity. We were given the opportunity to pitch our own idea, but then Mr. Smith had already uh, had an, uh, an option he had presented in the packet, which everyone already see uh, if you read it. 
And uh, it was a an application set from inside Rankin, which was to track work work ethic grades. Kind of like um, it's kind of like just you push updates to a course for specific students, and that's all that the work ethic grades were. So it was just storing them, kind of like edits are in our in our bug draft, which is kind of they're, they're essentially edits. And uh, so that application was to replace their current standard, which is just handwriting on paper. Yeah, basically there's a and you were having like, to you keep the log on how many keep those notes on paper and over and over again. So it's to try and digitize a lot of that and put it in an kind of electronic system to help you. Oh, so you hold on to the paper too. Well, the hope is that this gets away gets away of needing the paper at all, right? And just being able to do things all at once. So you were submitting the data to inside ranking though, right? That was yeah. cumbersome, but you're yeah. having to hold well, I had to write it down and then type it in the inside rank it. So we we didn't get all of the things done through that process yet, but we're kind of on the way, right? Right. So the application was to replace that because inside ranking is just not apparently not set up for the kind of thing they want this work ethic grade tracker to do. Uh, so that was the scope of the project. And there uh, it needs a database, of course, and it is um, an API if you were to use Mongo, uh, which is all we had experience with. So we use Mongo and we needed an API. And then uh, we use React for our friend because it was just easiest to do since we already know how to do it. Right, and that's, we kind of want that technology too because that's what we kind of teach them forward. So it's something that we can, we can maintain because we have that skills and we can defend them ourselves. So it's helpful to have something that you know, we know. <laughs> Actually, Zach uh, learned React, React all that all uh, on Friday. Yeah, he did. All on Friday. So he had never touched it before. Zach is from Mr. G's class. I think he was in our, I think he said it was he was in our class last semester. Uh, so last semester I was in C sharp. I guess he was also in C sharp last semester. Uh, he recognized me or he asked me something about that. So he has been a student before this semester, but yeah. So that just goes to show how easy React can be to pick up with someone to guide you at least. Uh, so this is uh this is the landing page. Uh, the application itself is like more geared towards teachers. So uh, you would sign in as a teacher. It's a separate account from inside ranking. You could have the same credentials, but it's a separate account from inside ranking. And so the teacher would sign in, and the idea is the teacher signs in, chooses one of their courses, or adds one of their courses for the teacher. You know, like, yeah, I'm just giving them a rundown, and then then they would push updates for work at the grades to the students. So that, that's all that the scope of the project is. So you, we can sign in right now. I think we have four accounts. Don, you want to sign in? I think the current status is that you sign in, and it doesn't it doesn't change uh, the data you see. But but that's the intention. You sign in as a teacher, and you would only see your course. But its current state is uh, it it doesn't do that. But that wouldn't be hard to implement. That'd be just an API. Uh, Oh, there it hey, is. So one thing I noticed about Mongo is if you don't if you don't touch it right away, is it true that if you if like some something about Mongo database where it, if you query it for the first time in a long time it takes a while to get kind of money? That's what I've noticed. Yeah, you know, my own project and with this one. So which is three clusters, they do go to sleep when you're not using it, and that's part of how they're able to. That so that's all that happened there. Any other time we demoed the project, snap. Very so nice. the 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 so right, so these are all the courses. They're just listing them straight from the database. You can see some of them were kind of like just Random text because uh, we, we entered those ourselves through the through the application itself. Uh, but if you click on one, it is it is a link and uh, it takes you to a page where you would see uh, the left hand side is a chance to add events, events being uh, changes to work ethic grade. So that would be like showing up to class on time or 
uh, participating in a, in a study group or bringing gun, a gun to school, you know, stuff that would change your work ethic, right? And so uh, that kind of stuff uh, is an event. And then on the right hand side are all the things that you've done on all the, all the previous events. So I think actually it is implemented right now. The previous events are, down. they should be filtered down. So you would choose someone and it filters it to that person. But if you don't choose anyone, it doesn't filter it. And that's just done in the same way that we have that match stage in our list bug. Remember we did that when we were Smith in the class once. So if you don't give a filter, it doesn't filter. But if you do give it one, it does. And that's what happened there. It was initially set for for nothing here, and then uh, when it changes to the Edelgard guy, then it only shows Edelgard uh, events. And these two these two were linked, so that was kind of that was kind of cool. These these two drop downs are linked. You change it to one on, on this side, and if you were at it, if you were to add something, go ahead and add it them. Get some form validation right here. Then ideally it shows up over here, but there is one bug introduced, and that is that uh, I accidentally set this to resetting. So these fields need to reset, but that should stay the same. And so you go back to this person, you see uh, the data would have been there right away if I hadn't put that bug in there. But anyway, yeah. That's all of those two. So part of what we'll talk about today is when you might notice that there's some more styling, some more grooming and stuff going on today on there. And that's one of the things that we'll kind of unpack is how can we rewrite this Cool. Because that's still bootstrap, believe it or not. Right? That's still bootstrap, even though it looks significantly different. Alright. Awesome. Um Minor note, I kind of had my own little hackathon, my own little jam while they were doing that. So I've got um, an account on NPM. And one of the things with NPM is you, we've already used a bunch of packages, but you can, anybody can publish their own packages. Um, I've got a bunch of them out there now. And I think I pushed one, two, three, five new packages, published five new packages this weekend. So those are out there, should you want to take a look at them. Um, it's up based on some of the code and stuff that we've done this semester, um, especially around middleware. So like the valid ID, the valid body, and some of the authentication middleware stuff I've kind of bundled up into a package. I'm like, ah, I can reuse this stuff. So, you know, that's a useful thing to think about too, you know, just as you're, you know, building things out and it's like, okay, I've got code I might want to reuse. You might try putting it up on NPM and then you can reuse it in future projects if it's something like that, that you find out you like can use again, right? So that's my little thing from there. So let's get into the kind of things I wanted to talk about. So first things I wanted to kind of call the attention that I haven't mentioned yet, uh, there is a really helpful uh, little Chrome extension actually for working with React. Um, it's called the React Developer Tools. Um, and I would recommend just let's go go ahead now and let's install that. Um, so if you go to, um, this is the one for Chrome, um, but I do believe it's available for other browsers. So if I go to React Dev Tools and maybe look for uh, extension and um, that's going to pull up here to this page um, now mine says remove from Chrome because I've actually already gotten installed but I would ask that you go ahead and, and install it at this point and I'll kind of show you um, what we can do with that um, there's a limit to I mean there is some value to this there is some limit I, part of it I haven't talked about it as much at talking or mention it yet is because there's a lot of things you can just easiest way to do it is just do console block because uh, it can do some things but it can't do everything but it does give you a way to inspect um, React apps online. It is worth mentioning that this tool can be used not only to inspect your own apps but other developers apps as well. Um, it's not limited to just apps that you have built. It's 
can look at anything that's online. So what I'm going to do now that I've got it installed, I'm just going to run one of my React projects, namely that, that pet adoption project, and we can kind of see um, and look at some of the things in that tool. So I'm going to do npm run, start, get server up and running. And we'll look at what we can pull out of that. So again, I'd recommend installing that, that extension so you kind of have this yourself and you can kind of play around with, with the things that are available there. Um, the main thing that it lets us do, the main two things that it lets us do is it lets us see, see what the structure of all the components are that are currently being rendered on screen, as well as what their state is, um, which is information that we can't really get by just inspect element. So it's kind of like an inspect element for React. Um, so we can see the React version of the tree um, rather than our version of the tree that's being, the real version of the tree which is being rendered. So it's easy to get to. Um, you just go to the developer tools or you can go to inspect. If you go over here, right, so there's a bunch of tabs obviously in the dev tools. Um, we've looked at elements, we've looked at console, sources, network. By now you've looked at most of these tabs. Um, but with this extension installed, there's two new tabs, right? So you'll see that there should be a components tab and a profiler tab. Um, the profiler tab there is to figure out why things are running slow. So we can tell you things like memory usage and, and runtime and, and et cetera. It helps you debug if, if you have problems in there. I haven't honestly used this for anything, so I can't say too much about the profiler tool. Um, but it's definitely something to be aware of that it's, that it's there. Um, the components one is, is probably is really where I spent the most time when I'm using this this extension. So what you'll see in here, right? What we see on the left is sort of this tree, and this is kind of where this looks like the same thing you get from inspect elements, right? But it's showing rather than the elements, it's showing the components. So you're seeing the tree of components. So we can see on this page up at the top, I've got that browser router which is enabling our React router functionality. We go down, there's a router, there's some sort of navigation provider, location provider. Actually, all of that is part of, those top four layers are all part of the browser router component itself. So you might notice the browser router has components inside of it. Um, so that's part of what's going on there. And then finally, we get down to our code. So you can see like there's the app components, it's signed of all of that. I've got a navbar component. I've got a toast container, I've got my routes, and, and so you can kind of start to see where those, those components are. Um, you can even see that inside of the nav bar, you see I've got these nav links um, that are what's taking us around the page, right? So we've got all of the components we can see, or I can see the footer. Now, what's useful, um, not just that I can see what the components look like, is that over on the right, um, I can see some information about every single one of these components. Namely, I can see any properties that they have received um, from up above. So for instance, if I look at app, you don't see any properties because it's not receiving any. Um, but if I were to look at the nav bar, I might see, hey, there's an off that's null and there's an on log out that's a function, right? So I can see what those properties are that are being passed down and what their values are. Um, and I can also see things from up here, like I can see that there's hooks, right? So I can see there's a hook for the state that's being stored as null. Now, one of the things you might notice here, this is coming from that use state hook. It doesn't have a name. So while with the use state hook, we do have names for those variables in our code, React actually doesn't know anything about those names for our states. So this dev tool, at least as it stands today, is not able to tell you what name that is. It doesn't know that that's off, okay? All it knows is, hey, I've got three state variables and it'll list them in the order that you declared them. So, because React's all re really just storing your state variables as an array. It's not actually storing them as names, um, is worth mentioning, right? Uh, now, there is, some, there is some work that's happening where the, the React team is actually trying to make this dev tool say the name 
there's I've seen some threads and some Twitter comments and discussions about that. So I know that there is something that's in, in the talks, but at, at current you can't. Um, you might also see there that there's like the navigate hook. So we can see that we're, we're bringing in the news navigate in there, etc. Um, and I can see what file there's there. So, so that can be helpful to kind of look at the different state variables. I can go down the login form, and that may be a little bit more interesting. I can see on login, show error. I can see the states. And in fact, if I start typing into these fields, we should see kind of that, that updates, right? You can see the state updates on the right um, as I type. So again, I can see some of these things that may not be visible. Yeah, shows me what I typed in there. That's true. <laughs> yeah, that is that is worth mentioning. Is it's is it storing? Because in memory, um, passwords aren't encrypted. Uh, when you're typing them in, that password field has no encryption. It's still in memory somewhere on your computer. So if somewhere we were to access your computer, be able to look at the memory there, we would see whatever password you have typed in. So, anyway, um, so we can see those kind of things, and I think if I hit login there, so I can see that this is my error message, and I think the last one, the fourth one, is my success. So that can be very helpful for debugging, especially because there may be things like there in the state variables that, again, you can't see in the elements view, but you can see here. Cool. Um, again, you can test all of this if you just do console logs. But sometimes you don't want to litter your code with console logs, and this can be a lot, a lot quicker to test some of those things. So that's number one, is that that extension can be helpful for working through a thing. I think we got that installed this weekend. I can't remember why, why, why that came up again, but it's like, oh, we need to talk about that. So that's a good thing to, to just know about. Next thing I want to point out, um, one of the things I'm going to ask you to do on 6.4, which you haven't done yet. Um, on 6.3, I didn't ask you to do the search interfaces yet, but here I do want you to do the search interfaces so you can search through bugs and users. So I want you to do that as part of this, this last lab. Um, inherently in there, I wanna make a quick note on as far as making those requests. Remember, we can make code requests with different methods. Um, remember, there's a little bit difference between say, posts and get. So if I'm making a post request, a common post request might be the login screen. I've got my URL. There's not really any variables there other than the root path. And I'm passing all the data in this data variable. Okay, so if I'm just doing a post, that's usually what we see, right? The data we need to send the server, we're sending it as, as data. Um, put really works the same way. You get a URL and you add the data into the data variable, right? Um, here in, in this case, let's say I'm updating a bug, I may also have in some additional data in the URL. So data that I wanna put in the URL, like this, that's gonna appear, remember, at the server under request.plams, right? So this is gonna be here under request.plams, this data is gonna appear on the server as request.bug, okay? And so you just got to remember where you're looking for that data. Now, get requests are a little bit special. Um, with get requests, you're not actually allowed to send the body. Um, body is not allowed with, with um, get requests. So I believe delete is the other exception as well. So post, put, and patch, I think all three of those allow you to send, send a body. Um, but get and delete, if I remember right, do not allow a body in the request. So oftentimes we need to send data to get requests, but again, because we can't send them as part of a body, we got to send them a little bit differently. Um, but the difference is pretty trivial. So rather than sending data, I said params. So data passes it through as request.body. This will be received on the server, kind of contrary to its name, Grams is actually received on the back end as request.query, request.query. So we call it params on the front end, and we call it request.query on the back end. So these params are not the params that you see on the back end, params on the back end are things like this that are in the URL, versus params on the front end are query on the background. 
I wish they used the same names, but they didn't. So, um, so that's what we have to pass is any data we want it to do. Um, it's also worth mentioning how these are going to be received and how are they're going to be sent. So I mentioned that they're not sent as part of the body. So when we send these things over, let me get my zoom and, and zoom in on this. So I've got a bunch of values here, keywords, classification, open is true, close is false, max is not, max age is 90, page size is that. All of that data is going to be sent to the server as one long URL, is how that gets sent. Let me go to 150. So this is this is what the server would receive, and this is long URL. Instead of that data and the get request being part of the body, it's going to be in part of the URL. So the way that gets added, you see here's the base URL, localhost 2000, API bug list. Okay, that's the part that we're listing as the URL. The part after comes from that params object. So the first parameter that comes in, we start it with this little question mark. Question mark says the, the query parameters start here. Everything after here is query parameters and it's not part of the actual URL, not part of the body. Okay. So that says, okay, something's happening. Um, from there, you'll see I have like keywords use application crash. Okay? And remember, if I look at what I have here, the string that I passed though was application crash with a space. Okay, You might notice that there's a percent 20 here. Okay? So percent 20 is used to replace spaces because you can't actually have spaces in the URL. It's worth noting. Spaces in the URL typically consider it illegal. So um, I have to replace those with the percent 20. So that percent 20 will be in the URL, but actually it will go away by the time you ask for it in the back end. So in the back end, it will still come out as application space crash. Okay. So that's something that just kind of happens automatically most of the time. But you have to be careful if you're manually trying to build up that URL you're going to have problems where you accidentally put in special characters like ampersands and, and uh, question marks and things like that. If you're manually making the URL, say with the template sprint, you have to escape, escape those things yourself. Uh, thankfully, by putting it within the params object, it automatically escapes everything for you to make it safe. Cool? So that's one of the reasons why you want to do it that way rather than rather than trying to modify that and put that on the template site. This will automatically URL all the things like that. So, we've got keywords. You'll notice that the second parameter starts with an ampersand and from there on out. So, classification is true, and open is true, and close is false, and match is right, and page size is 100. So, the ands separate all of the, all of the query parameters after the first one. First one's a question mark. Then from there, it's all ampersands. Cool. That's important to remember. I can't tell you how often this comes up where you need to look at a URL and kind of understand what's going on there. Okay. Um, it's also worth mentioning because these parameters are being sent over the URL, um, there's a lot of things in the network that can potentially see your URL. These are not private. Anybody who's able to see your traffic can see this stuff completely unencrypted. Um, the other thing with get, um, these can be what we say cached, where I can use the response from one from one query for another query. I can replay it and I can say, oh, I'm just going to give this same document again and not do all the work to regenerate it. That's not true with, say, post and put requests. If you do a post and put request, those can't be cached, but get requests can. That's important with this, where we're talking about doing searches because we typically want to reuse those searches. Searches are kind of expensive to run. And so, uh, and you, a lot of people do the same, the same search over and over again. So if you can cache those, then you can make things run faster the second time through. Cool. So that's, that's part of why we want to talk about that and part of why we want to do that here. Uh, any questions there? So you kind of understand what's going on. Okay. Now there's a caveat here that you might want to pay attention to. How's the data being sent over? Notice it's all in the URL. It's all, it's all strings. It's all strings, right? It's not possible to pass anything other than a string 
in the URL. Everything has to be a string. Everything has to be converted to a string, which means on the back end, we will always receive it as a string. Uh, we won't receive this age as a number. We won't receive page size as a number. It will be as a string. Similarly, open, true, closed, false. Those will be received as the string true and the string false be converted. And so we won't receive those as booleans. Cool? Those are things you have to watch out and be aware of. Um, the good news is that we've already, if you're using Joy, right, that will, running things through a Joy schema, you can have it automatically convert those to the right type. And so, so that can be helpful. Uh, but it's worth rem remembering that we didn't use a Joy schema with the search routes. Reason being, we, uh, unlike when you're, say, posting data, generally speaking, if you, you say, I want to get and you send an invalid parameter, we just gracefully handle it. We just say, okay, well, you didn't send me invalid data. Maybe I'll treat it as if you didn't send me that parameter at all. So one of the things we have to do is be a little bit more graceful, and, and we can't really use joy in that space. So we have to be more careful about converting our types and things like that. Cool? So that's that's a quick mention there. Um, another thing I want to mention is is you may have seen it I, in the example there. I kind of gave you a, a select field control, and I think I, I mentioned this to a few people of how to use that. But there's a special property in um, React called the children property, and the children property behaves unlike the other pro unlike a regular property. It doesn't behave like normal normal properties. Okay, um, the way we use it is to kind of place content inside of a component, inside of our components. And so it kind of looks like this. So here's an example of a component that receives a children property. Okay, so we're going to list it in here. ID children rest, right? So this receives the property ID, the property children, and actually there should be another dot there for rest, all the remaining parameters. Okay, so in that perspective, children just looks like a regular property, right? Just looks like a regular property. What I then do with that is I include it somewhere in the HTML, somewhere in my output, somewhere in my render, where I want those children to appear. So here I've got my select tag. I say, okay, let's add an ID parameter and whatever other parameters I might want to manually set. Let's include all the remaining, all the rest. Here's the close tag. But you'll notice between the, the open and the close, I've got this curly brace children. So what I'm telling is, take whatever is in that children and literally put it here. Now that children can be just a string or it could be JSX. And usually what it is, is it's a JSX expression. It's actually a tree of elements, okay, is what we're passing through there typically, okay. So this is what it kind of looks like. You know, notice, notice in terms of building a component, it's not really that different from any other component, any other property. It just, we're typically going to do something like this, okay. Now, let's look at how we use that. So I created this drop-down element above. The way I use it here is looks like this. So I've got drop down, I'm passing in a bunch of parameters. Remember the ID, I said we're going to treat ID specially, but the rest of these would fall into rest because I didn't tell it what to do. Now, you'll notice I don't have a children property, right? I keep nowhere here and here in my saying children equals, okay? So the way the children gets populated is by the stuff that's between the open and the end. Okay, so these, these elements here will be the children, these options. And so it, pro means it provides us a way to build elements that aren't just like, here's an empty tag, doesn't have a start. If I have something that I need a, a start and an end, and I want to put content between, that's how we do it. Cool. We can do that for things like dropdowns. We can do that things for like cards. Maybe I want to create a card component and stuff all the stuff inside of there, um, that's a common thing you might do, is you might say, hey, I've got a card, all the children will go into 
maybe the body of that card, or I might section it out with a header, footer, etc., etc. Um, so this is a pretty common thing, especially when you're dealing with layouts, um, as far as ways to or wrappers and things like that. Cool. So that's one thing I mentioned, just about the children property, and I think I already talked a bit about some people with that one-on-one, -on -one, but if you hadn't looked that up or whatnot, I hadn't explicitly talked about that in the lecture yet. Questions? Okay, so that that covers just the quick topics I wanted to talk about and hit on that we didn't have a chance to kind of talk about previously um, or, or call back to your attention. And so I want to throw out the, the kind of the kind of floor there for, for any questions that you might have right now about React that maybe I can answer before we get into SAS. Um, to some sense, yes. I mean, the the purpose the purpose of React is to kind of dynamically adjust and change and work with the HTML. So that's kind of true. Um, whereas the SAS stuff is is focused on on making CSS. So yeah, it it's kind of falls on there that that division in some way, shape, or form. It's worth mentioning React has a lot more JavaScript in it, right? So it's not pure HTML. It's a lot of like mix of, of JavaScript and HTML. Um, but SAS is purely purely a way to deal with CSS. Any other questions? Anything else there? Anything you guys ran into with 6.3 that you, you want me to answer and kind of talk through that maybe you ran into some issues that you have some questions and, and blockers? There. How are you guys feeling on your issue tracker so far? I hear a hmm. Well, I didn't work on it all weekend, so yeah. I'm still worrying on that. But. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so let me talk about that real quick. So the, that is one thing that comes up for me often. So I talked about briefly how to use the children prop for a drop down, which is one of those things you really want to know about. Let's talk about how to get the data. So starting with kind of the simple version of this, is typically what I want is something that's a select tag with a series of options. So I've got a select tag and I've got a series of options inside. Okay, we know that part from the HTML, right? So what I then want to do is typically have some of those options be dynamically generated, right? That's that's kind of where you're standing. Is we want to pull that data dynamically, and it might be coming from the database, it might be coming from an API endpoint, it may be coming from who knows where. There's a lot of different places where that data could be coming from, but what all kind of unifies it is wherever we get it, I'm typically going to get it as an array of things of some sort. I'm typically going to get it back from that data source as an array of objects. Okay, so it's just a matter of, of taking that array and turning it into something we can display. Right. So that's problem number one. Is problem number one is typically get that array, you know, and figure out you know hard code, maybe hard code some sampling data in with that array and kind of 
see what you can do with that. Now, you remember that we dynamically, if we want to dynamically render elements, we typically use the, the map, right? We use the map to generate options. So what I might do, and I might start, is I might say, okay, um, let's, let's render those options. And I'm going to leave this one up here, and we'll talk about that one in a minute. Oftentimes, I'll have some options that are maybe hard-coded and always there, um, but I may also have options that are dynamic. So it might look something like this, map, options, and maybe then I say, okay, so for each of these options, I want to do something. And so that may be to generate an option tag. Because I'm doing map, remember, that means you need to give a key to these elements. So a common thing that people forget is to add that key. But that key will typically be whatever the, the primary key is. So it's usually going to look like that. Okay. And, and also, actually, usually, um, you're going to need a value on that. Okay. It turns out that most of the time, the value you want is also the primary key. That's not always the case. You know, that really depends on, on situation to situation. But usually what you want the user to do is pick an element from the database. Okay? So you're going to have the key and the value in most of those times will be just the ID. Okay? Next part that we have is what do we show as the text of that option? Right? And so that's typically going to be something to the form of like maybe the name of what it is. Um, and, and that's something where you really, this is where I end up usually playing around with the most code is this part in between, uh, figuring out how I want those things to look in the drop down, and sometimes it pulls from more than one field. But most of the times it's just as simple as like, hey, the value of the thing is the ID, and the, the text that the user sees is the name of the thing. Okay, so we start with that. We start with a map, and then I'm going to close back out the select. So that's where I would start with, with doing dynamic drawings, right? Is first and foremost, start with an array, figure out the map part, right? And then you can kind of start to hook in the rest of the part, which I think is what you're asking about is the network thing. Um, but I want to mention that this part there first, right? So this is this is one half of the solution. One half of the solution is that assuming I have an array, actually I should make this to be plural, this would be options, I would be generating it that way. Now, the reason I have a hard-coded option up here, usually what happens um, is we usually have the first option needs to be one of two things. It either needs to be the value that the user's already picked, or it needs to be everything, right? We usually need to have an invalid value up there that can be the quote unquote default because the first item in the array was always selected. The first item in the drop down is always selected by default. Cool. So oftentimes that first option will be something like this. Value is blank, and then depending on what I do, so for instance, if I'm trying to do search, um, I might put the text all in there, right? And so I say by default, my default option is that everything's selected, versus maybe I say, you know, I filter to just some specific thing, right? So you think about like, okay, by default, all of the classifications show up for all the roles, right? But then if I filter down, then I want to just show this specific role or this specific classification or whatever. Cool. Okay. Um, or if I'm saying who is it assigned to, I might leave that empty, right? And I just say, okay, well the default, the default value there is it's nothing selected, so I need to tell the user to pick something. Okay. Cool. So that's that's kind of the, the HTML side. So how you render it is usually something like that. Does that answer? Do you have any questions on that side? Anybody else have questions on this side? Does that kind of make sense? 
Okay. Um, so now let's talk about how we get the data. So here I'm presuming that I have an array of options, right? The question is, the next question is, where did I get that, right? Where did I get those options? Okay. So usually what I do is I might lay it out like something like this to start with. So I say quants, options is equal to underscore ID one name Just populate it with enough data that you can test um, that the dropdown itself is working, assuming you have the ID one. So there is an array of options. Should be in more than one place where this comes up. Yeah, should be in two places where this comes up. So this is where I start, right? Is is I start with let's just try it with hard coded I hard coded array of options. Okay, try it there. And in fact, it turns out that some cases you may have just always the, the options are hard coded. So if we think about, for instance, with classifications, well, we have a fixed number of classifications that are legal, approved, unapproved, and duplicate. There are no more, there's no need to do a database call for those options, right? Similarly with roles. Roles are um, like developer, quality analyst, etc. There, there's not a need for a database call for those things. You could go to the database and ask for all the roles. We could make that a network request um, because we have put the roles into a database table, but it's not strictly necessary because they're not changing. Cool? Good so far, right? So, so this is what we're trying to achieve, okay? Now, the problem then comes is what happens if it's not, it's not hard-coded? It's something I can't pull from just hard-coding the objects. Like, if we're talking about who is, the, who is the bug assigned to, I don't know all the user lists ahead of time, and the user list is constantly changing. You know, you, your users can register it and maybe be deleted, and I need those to be Add it and remove from the list. Cool. Yes. So would you look through like a get request from a database and then store in the information that you receive from it? Yep. Yep. So so that's where where I I switch my starting point. You know, now that I've tested it that way, I go over to something like this. So I say const. Options, set options, is equal to use state, and I'm going to start it out as null because, well, initially I don't have any data whatsoever. I don't even have an empty array because the request hasn't even been made yet. Cool. So, but I'm carving out a place to save that array. That's the number one, is, is I need to store it in state. If it's not fixed, it's not known ahead of time, then I need a state variable to store that list. Cool? Okay. And so then, yeah, I get into a user fact to actually pull that list. So I might say user fact, and in here, I'm going to define a function which is going to do that request, right? And so usually what happens in this case is I need to pull it from the API. I need to make a network request, an HTTP request, and pull it from Axios. It could be anything. 
this could be coming, you know, the, the part that's here in the music effect wouldn't necessarily need to be Axios, it's wherever the data is coming from. Cool. Could be a bunch of other things. But anywhere where you're pulling the data from, you want to do that here. So the idea being is initially the list of options is null, you don't have it, and then shortly after the page loads, we're going to retrieve it. Okay? And then from there we'll have it and it will work with the other things that we had done before. So from here, I would do something like an Axios request. I'm going to have obviously my URL, right? And my URL would be to go wherever I need those options. So let's just say for illustration purpose, maybe I'm going to users. So maybe I want to populate this with users. So I might go to um, slash API slash users slash list. Okay, so that would give me the list of users, and obviously you change that based on actually user single. Um, you change that based on what you're trying to retrieve, right? So, for instance, if I was trying to retrieve courses, I'd be courses. If I tried to, you know, get all the bugs, I might be yeah, I don't need to do that. So I have a URL. All right, so what parameters do I need to pass? Typically, you're going to say, well, the method here is a get request. Typically, you're trying to get data. Uh, so that's going to be the most sensible thing there. Um, we're going to have our headers. And that would be auth stuff. Because usually I, I may need to provide an auth token just to prove that I'm logged in. And if I have additional stuff like that I need to send, for instance, you might pass those in params, which we just kind of talked about already. So if you have some additional things that you need to send, it would look like that. Cool. So the Axios request is kind of just like any other Axios request. Any other <coughs> So, in here, next thing I want to do is I want to say then we get the response. Well, the response from this is going to be an array. So, all I need to do is say set options. Okay, whenever I've called that variable, whenever I've called that getter. So, here I would say, okay, let's set the options to res.data. Because res.data is what the server returned, and in theory it should be, uh, in theory it should be. Now, if you don't know those things, there's, there's some more error checking I would generally recommend. But that's, if you trust the data, that's all you've got to do. Cool. And then obviously you have your cache. Deal with the error with whatever you need to do, which usually means show it to the user in some shape or form or fashion. Because remember, this could fail, right? And if it does fail, then the user is not going to have any options to pick from, right? So we have a problem there, and that definitely needs to be dealt with, and definitely needs to for the user. Um, so then we end up with the user fact. The question is then, what do you what do you put here? So remember we have this array which says when you know these values, when these values change, I need to rerun it. So I need to figure out what are the things that that kind of feed in there will cause me to run the request again. Okay? Yeah. Auth is auth is one of them. Yep, auth is pretty much always going to be one of them. If user logs in or logs out, you probably need to run that again. Right? You probably need to go get that data again because it's very likely that you won't get the same data back. Cool. So generally it's safe to go ahead and drop off there. If I have anything else that I'm passing through, so let's say it's in the URL here, or it's in params, those would also be things that I need I would need to put in there because that would mean I need to rerun the rerun the query and get an updated list of options. Cool. So for instance, um, if the course ID was part of that, you know, you might have to put in course ID here. 
right? It's just those things that change the report. Cool. So oftentimes it may just look something like that. Um, now, if I think about bugs, if I'm retrieving stuff for, for a specific bug, it might be like, hey, if I'm looking at another bug, I need to get the list again because the bug might have different options. So oftentimes that's that's all that looks like, right? It's just doing another use effect to go get that list of options. And that's usually in addition. So I think one of the places you, you, you run into this is if I want to ch choose the user that's assigned to a bug, right? I might need to go load those users. And so that's that's one case this can come up. And you'll notice that you probably have another use effect that's going and retrieving the bug object as well. It's good to have those as separate use effects. If you're doing an Axios request like this, I would really recommend only doing one Axios request per use effect. It's good to keep those separated. That's actually recommended from uh, the React docs itself. If you look at the React docs, the React tutorial about um, hooks and use effect, they really suggest to limit those effects to much more of a narrow scope and have multiple use effects. Um, the upside of that is this is something if I wanted to reuse, I could potentially extract it and turn this into a custom hook is one thing that happens oftentimes. Is I find things like this, like, oh, I'm using that a lot. I could extract this code and turn it into a custom, custom hook. That way I don't have to write it every time. I don't think you have any cases where it makes sense to extract this personally in your in your bug tracker. We're not quite there, where there's or there's enough value and enough sense to, to extract it as a custom hook, but you could. Cool. Everybody good with that? Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. So it's it's really not anything more than kind of what we've talked about, right? We we've kind of talked about all of those pieces of, of dealing with state, doing the map. And, and doing the use effect and doing the access request. And it's just a matter of, of learning how to put those pieces together. Cool. So there's nothing really new in the theory. It's just, you know, how do you do it in practice, which isn't that one. Okay. Any other blockers that people ran into? Michael, I think you had an issue on the test. Do you remember what that was? Mm -hmm. Things where something wasn't refreshing. Do you remember what the case? Do you remember what the case of that was? Oh no, no, I'm not going to remember. Okay, so let's look at it. I, if I remember right, it was something like um, this. Uh, let's say I have an array, I'm going to make this state, um, oh, okay, sorry, I'll try to really, I think you're trying to delete something, and it did delete. Uh -huh, I press the delete button on the thing that we were trying. Yeah, so let's talk about it in kind of a simplified um, setting. So you state, and I'm going to just put three items in here. One, two, three. I'm just going to deal with them as numbers. So what we wanted to do is something to the effect of um, on when when the user clicks something. The only reason I call this out because I think it's it's a worth illustration thing, and I don't know, I don't think you were maybe the only one that had that issue. So, what you had, I think you were using slice, right? Slice. 
So I think you did something like slice one and then set items items. I think that's what you have. That's all the code that matters. Right? So we said, hey, um, let's do a slice and then we'll call set items. So one of the things that I'm going to understand about slice, so slice is going to remove the item at index one. And that's going to, in theory, should turn the array into the array one, three. So at this point, after I've run that, items is equal to that. Is the array one, three. But slice does what we said is modifies the array in place modifies the array in place. Anytime you're modifying an object or an array in place, you're changing the thing itself. Okay? You're not making a copy of it and making the copy different. You're changing the thing itself. Okay? In place edits don't work with React. Okay? Because the reason is in, in order for React to know that things have changed, it has to know that things have changed, right? In order for it to actually update and re-render the screen. It has to know what has changed. And so if I do this, I'm modifying the original items array. If I try to tell React about that, it'll be like, eh, it's the same as the array before, right? It's nothing's changed. As far as its perspective, you were rendering items before, you're still rendering items. So nothing's changed, okay? So anytime I wanna make a change, I have to make a copy of the data. That's one of the things you have to remember is whatever state variables you have, you can't mutate them. You have to make a copy and, and have the, the copy be mutated. Cool? So slice basically can't be used at all with React. You might find that answer on Stack Overflow. It might work if you're using jQuery or something else. It's not going to work with React. Okay? You can't do con Another item equals item. Slice one another. Item. Okay, so let's try this. If I if I do that one switch, what you're saying is, what if I what if I change this a little bit, and I say const new items is equal to items, and I say new items, instead of items, I say new items dot slice one and then set items new items. That's what you're suggesting, right? Doesn't work. Why not? I haven't actually changed anything. Yeah. These are the same. This is this is the same this is the same place in memory. Items and new items are the same are are just references to the array. I haven't actually copied the array. I've just had two pointers to the same array. Items points to this array, new items points to the same array. I've just copied the reference. I haven't actually copied the array. So I need to actually copy and do that. So there's one thing I can do, which will make sure that there's a copy. If rather than just blindly doing this, I do dot, dot, dot items, new items is now a copy. New items is now a copy. And so then if I do slice, it's slicing that copy, and then I set it back. So if I just do this, that solves the problem because it forces there to be a copy. And then when I come down here, you call set items, it's saying, okay, set it to this new array. React looks at that, it's like, oh, I have items. You're setting it to this new array, this new copy called new items. So it doesn't care about the name. And it's like, okay, that's actually different because they point to two different places in memory. Right? 
So in order for React to know that there's a change, the, the array has to actually be a new array. It has to be a new array in the loop. There's no way we can get around creating a copy of the array. Which does mean that some, you know, that your your more memory is required. Unfortunately, there's no way around that. You've got an item with a hundred things, and you want to remove one. We have to make a copy that's going to have that nine hundred nine nine that ninety nine things. So you still have one hundred and ninety nine for briefly a period of time before it sorts everything out. So that does unfortunately increase memory usage, and that copy is not cheap, but it's what we have to do. Cool. Does that help? The problem is that you weren't making a copy. Um, and so one of the things I do, rather than using slice, um, there's an easier paradigm that you can go through. Um, rather than using slice, what we typically do is we just filter. So if I say set items, And I say, let's take the items and filter them. Items.filter. That would have the same effect because filter inherently makes a copy. And so if I take advantage of that behavior of filter that it already makes a copy, then I can avoid, um, I can make sure that there's actually that explained. Cool? So I'd actually recommend if you're deleting things, use use filter. It's a better, it's a better paradigm to go through than use use slice. Slice is good if you need that in place, that in you know in place modification to the array. But usually we want to make a copy. But usually we want to avoid modifying the original thing. Cool. Does that kind of point to the issue that you had? Right? And that's that's a thing to watch out for. If you see things not updating, it's usually a chance that you're not copying. Okay. Filter comes over right. Yep. Or you could use a low dash. Because I can do the same thing here using low dash. Um, it'd be just underscore dot filter items. And then the same the same function. Right. You can do the same thing with underscore filter. This one works if items is null. This one crashes if, if item is null. So that's why I usually do this one so it doesn't crash on me. So that's a kind of a common botch. I think that tripped up. That tripped, that tripped up too. You have to watch that. Um, I feel like there is there was something else, and I'm trying to remember what what it was. Oh, on that note, um, how do I know which thing to delete? Because I hard coded one. How do I know what what item to delete? Well, the gotcha is this function can't know. This function can't know what it is. So, so typically you have to pass that in via some sort of parameter. So usually I'm passing the item in here that I want to delete via parameter there. 
and then I just say um, what I want it to get rid of. Or if I just know the index, I might say uh, maybe call it something else. I'll call that IDX, and then this would be IDX here instead of hard coding it as one. So it's usually just a matter of when you hook up the onhook event itself, you may have to provide some additional information. Okay. I forget, there was something else I'm trying to think of, but I can't remember, I can't remember what the other one was that I saw. Other questions? Okay, so let's, um, let's see, we're at uh, 148. Um, let's go ahead and just take a quick 10 minute break and then I'll, I'll jump in and we'll talk about SAS. And we're going to do that with the, the kind of option product project. Yes. So you're saying, okay, so initially we've got no cards, we load it from local storage. Uh, here's, here's the problem. So you're, when you're putting it in your JSON string environment, this is now a string. So let's, let's, let's call this out and think about the problems we'll turn it on this right now. Yep. Um, so what I want to do, put that on the one way out of the opposite of the string file. So that um, first search is not defined in the So first one down. Yeah, so you can add one connectors to these down. So what you can say is that you can one save what's in your state, and one save down, especially with the value of the person. So that would be one. You want to save the same version. So that's part of why I was trying to get the old list. This should be functional. So we do cars. We chose the list and we did it by the so initially there's nothing, right? We're looking for the page source, and then the left hand, the resident installer, the right extension, that the React web page. So React. That's where I would start. So.
So if I close this browser
Okay. Back to it. So the rest of the rest of my kind of topics and stuff that I want to cover today is all going to be around making our things look basically better, right? Styling it, adding in all, all you know, adding in themes adding in fonts and playing with colors and, and maybe even hopefully a little bit with icons. Okay, so that's kind of what I want to look at here. So first of all, um, what is SAS? So, so SAS stands for Syntactically Awesome Style Sheets and they've got a website. Um, you can go to sas.lang.com and in fact they've got a really good explanation of what SAS is and, and their, their learn path is actually really, really simple. Um, so I'll go over there in a second and I'll kind of show you um, what's what's there. Um, so the where the place where we start, um, because we've already pulled in create React app, yeah. yep. Has anybody really attention how awesome that name is? It's a pretty it's a pretty cool name. And in fact, if you look at their website, they're pretty proud, they're pretty proud of it. Um, they call it CSS with superpowers, <laughs> right? Um, so it's it's a pretty awesome language in terms of, of setting things up. Um, we'll kind of look at what it is. It's actually probably one of the easier things to learn, especially in the context and the scope that we're in. So in terms of making this work with Create React App, it's really easy to get started. Um, we only need one dependency: npm install known SAS. That's the one thing we have to add. To get started, that's not already built in with Create React App. I will mention that in general, if we're not using Create React App, this requires a bit more setup. Um, so typically, when I've been using this, I've been using this with Webpack, and then I have to do all the Webpack and do CSS. And there's, there's a few more things depending on your context that you may have to do. So we're kind of in a simple case where Create React App has kind of done all the hard work to get this setup already. They just haven't turned it on by default because maybe not everybody needs to do SAS. So you just have to install that package to turn it on. Um, so that's where I'm going to start in my project. Is I'm going to go to this, the Node React App project, or 
pet adoption react and I'm going to kill the server and I'm going to do npm install node sas so we're going to start with that number one yeah pet adoption you could probably follow along with this on the thing that you're working on if you wanted to yeah this is pretty cool so that's the one thing we have to do is npm node sas um, I'll install another dependency too in a minute when we get to it, but that's the only one we need to get started. Okay, so now let's look at how we start using these things. Um, what I'm going to do, you'll kind of remember here under uh, components, under source, we have our app.js file and our index.js file. What I'm going to do, now that I've installed the dependency, is I'm going to add a new file called app.scss. App.scss. Um, and you'll probably see it as this little icon, this, this SAS icon that we have here. Um, one thing that's kind of confusing with SAS is we call it SAS, and actually the builder, the runtime that does, that does SAS has an A in it versus the file extension has now a C in it. And the way I understand that, there was a .sas file or format originally, which people did used to use, .sas files, and that kind of fell out of favor with this newer syntax, SCSS. The good news is the SCSS format is a lot easier to learn than the SAS format, uh, because it's intentionally designed to be very close to CSS, <clears throat> kind of that CSS with superpowers idea. So um, the good news about how this works, if that file extension is, is SCSS, you can put all of your regular CSS file in there. You can literally treat this as a regular CSS file, and all of the syntax that you're used to will work. But there's some additional features that we can take advantage of, right? So is CSS plus some enhancements. Okay, so I need to link up that app CSS file um, to here, app SAS file. And so I'm going to go to the app and I'm going to import anywhere in here. Maybe I'll do it here uh, or maybe I'll do it up top. So uh, let's go import. I'll just do this at the top line so nothing's conflicting. Dot app dot SCSS. Okay. So that first two steps of creating a file, uh, creating basically a CSS file and then importing it in the component is the same as what you would do with the CSS file. Okay? It's the same as what you would do with the CSS file. What happens kind of next is where, where things start to get interesting. Okay. So I create a CSS file, I link it up, and let me now start the server again. npm run start. I'm going to start the server back up and run. Okay. So nothing's going to be different yet um, because I haven't uh, actually changed anything. I haven't put any styles or any code into that file yet. Okay. So back to my notes. Um, I'm going to toss this on my other my other screen. So I've got my notes. I've got my code here. And I'm going to pull this in. Beep. Beep. Go to the app sounds file. There. Okay. Close others. All right. So, just like a regular CSS file, um, I can do things like, let's say I want to change the color of my links. Okay, so maybe I want to change the color of the links to be color red, because right now they're blue. Okay, I can do that. Okay, um, I could also do things like um, change the change it when it's hovered. So I might say a hover color um, green. Is 
So that's number one, is, is I can do just regular CSS star stuff like this, okay? The next thing I can do is, here's where we start to get into the SAS specific stuff. So I can bring in um, some more interesting, interesting bits, like variables. So let's say I want to have maybe a link uh, inactive. You'll notice that I start this with a dollar sign. Dollar sign says I'm declaring a variable. And so I say maybe link inactive is that green color. And uh, actually that would be my red. red. Um, and my link uh, active is green. There's nothing special about these names. These are names I'm just coming up with on the fly. What I can then do is use these variables in my code. So first things first, one of the things you get with, with SAS is this ability to define variables in your, in your file. is I can declare variables like red and green and, and fonts and, and other things like this. I can declare them um, and then use those variables instead of hard coding that color maybe multiple times, right? Because a lot of times when you're writing CSS, you'll find yourself putting the same thing repetitively, right? And because these things are all in variables, it's very easy to just go to the top of the file, tweak a variable, and things look different. Right, so I want to say, hey, all my links are different. Color, make it um, yellow, and and now all my links are yellow, right? And I'm going to go back to red, though. So so you can kind of play around with with variables as the first bit. Now let's look at what the browser is seeing. Um, it's worth mentioning that the browser can't understand SAS, kind of like it can't understand JSX. This is part of why it's easier to do this with React, um, is because you're already going through this tool chain that's turning it into JavaScript that the browser can handle. We can also at the same time take the SAS and turn it into CSS that the browser can handle. So if I look at the link, right click inspect, um, you won't actually see those variables. Um, so from this perspective, you see over here it says anchor tag, color red. As far as the browser is concerned, it's actually receiving a CSS file with the red hard coded. It's not a variable. It's not actually a variable from the browser's perspective. So when the browser receives it, all of the variables have been stripped out. Cool? And that's one thing to understand. We can see that this is pre processed. The pre processing strips out all the SAS stuff and makes it just regular CSS. Another, so that's one trick I can do. Another trick I can use with SAS is I can nest rules. So here, right, regular CSS, I have to repeat that logic. I have to say, okay, here's this. I have to repeat the classes. So oftentimes you might see things like, hey, um, let's see if I can log in. Oh, my server's not running. I may need to run my backend. Let me go ahead and get my backup, backend up running. So I can log in past that point. NPM run start dev. There we go. So I'm in here. So I've got a link, um, and I might want to say, well, let's let's target, let's do other things like. Uh, let's combine these rules. So I may want to take this, nest it. That's actually equivalent. So, so SAS allows you to nest rules inside of other rules. Okay? So here what I'm saying is first thing applies to anchor tag, and this applies to the other thing, followed by app hover. So this says all the links that are hovered apply this time. So that's equivalent to what we had just done, but becomes especially powerful when I need to do things like, okay, well, maybe I need to target at 
and anchor tags and all the anchor tags that are in a card. Which actually is some, one thing we have to do with the project this week. And as I want to say, all the cards, all the, the anchor tags on the link also get that same styling. And I might say also in here at, at hover. So, so two parts that we can do again is we can do variables and we can also do this nesting. Um, so those, those are two parts that we can, two parts we can put in, right? So this would be equivalent to, um, if I kind of look at my example here, let's say I had this SAS. I've declared four colors, three or four variables. I've got an A, I've got card A, I've got text decoration underlined, and I've got a. So I'm going to take this and I want to look at how this renders out as regular CSS. So if I take that and I render that out as regular CSS, this is what the browser actually gets. Again, all the variables are gone. They're not declared in there. We just have blue and black. But we have those nested rules get turned into rules that are not nested because the browser doesn't understand nested rules. Cool? Okay. So let's take a quick look at just the documentation on SAS for some of these things. So those are those are kind of two places that we want to understand. So um, go to the saslang.com, go to documentation. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And oh. Oh no, I'm being need to be in learn SAS. That's where I want to be in learn SAS. So zoom back out. There we go. So they kind of show you some of these examples. So as they say, variables are kind of a way to store things within your within your style sheets and use them. So they've got the example here of, of like block, primary, and border color. So if you're setting those things here, unless they've kind of got part of it, so 100% and a variable, you can do those things too. Primary and color. And then again, this is what the browser sees, right? So the browser doesn't know about any of those things are happening because you do all of it on the back end. Similarly, they've got an example with nesting, which is a little bit more maybe than what we just looked at. They've got a nav, and they say, okay, ULs, LIs, anchor tags, right? So using that nesting, they're saying, here are a bunch of things related to nav, so we can keep those grouped together rather than kind of getting split up and spread out over the CSS file. You put those together, and then it will still generate it out to the browser as not as So now you're going to go on. Yeah. 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 Cool. So there's, there are some other features. There are some other features in SAS, like partials and mix-ins. But I think you get the most bang your buck just knowing those two. If you just start with understanding that there's variables and there are nested rules, you can do most things with, with SAS. Um, and then if you get to a point where you need more things, go ahead and read the documentation. It's kind of the beauty of SAS, is you can start small, start with, okay, I already know how to do SAS, let me add some features, and then if I find out later, hey, I need to know some, about some of these other things, we can, we can add those in. But that will give us, just those two alone, will give us a good way to start customizing Bootstrap, which is what we want to do next, right? Is I want to use this to customize the Bootstrap style sheet and change how it operates, okay? So let's talk about that. So, in order to, you know, if we kind of look at the, the base theme, the base theme that comes with Bootstrap, it's intentionally actually very generic. It's supposed to be, right? It's supposed to be just the baseline to get you up and running very quickly, and they kind of have that foundation, right? So, the good news, though, is we can get out of that, that generic look and feel if we know how to do a little bit of SAS, if we know how to play with these variables and nest rules and, and other things such as mix-ins and, and etc., um, you can start to customize it and even extend it and add more features, add more classes and say, okay, for instance, maybe maybe the Excel 
uh, maybe the XL breakpoint, which is the biggest one, maybe I need an extra, extra large. Well, we can do those kind of things with, with the SAS. We can add additional breakpoints. Um, we can change the default font. We can change the whole color palette, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's almost everything. Once we get into SAS, we can change almost everything about Bootstrap, which is awesome. So we can end up with something that looks very, very different from that default styling. Okay. So first thing we have to look at is, is you know how, how, how we just talked about variables. Well, so there's a bunch of variables built in. And if you look through the Bootstrap docs, pretty much every page in there, if you go to the bottom, you'll find a section about SAS, and most of them talk about variables. So a very good place to start talking about those variables is with the color palette itself. So if you're looking at the Bootstrap docs, if you go under the utilities, colors, and then variables, uh, SAS variables, you'll find a section like this. It says most color utility, blah, 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 blah. Um, so they've actually got some, actually, I think I snipped the wrong, the wrong place that I wanted to look at. So let me pull this up. This is down under SAS variables. We'll see here um, that we've got some variables, primary, secondary, success, info, warning, danger, light, uh, dark. We can change all of those colors. We just say, okay, that's the variable. We're going to change it to something else. Okay? So what that's going to look like, let me test this real quick. This is not going to work, but and we'll talk about why it doesn't work. Um, so let me get rid of what we had here and try to play with just the primary and the secondary colors. So is my server still running? Maybe, maybe not. There it is. So um, in here, back to that. What did I do? File not found. OK. All right, so from here, I might want to say, well, the default color uh, of primary is blue. Let's try to change it to red and just see if anything happens. And maybe uh, secondary is green. OK, so we change those variables. We note that nothing actually changes so far. So one thing that's worth noting is that the order that things run in does matter. OK, so and the if we want to replace those variables and change those, we have to be in the SAS world. So the reason why this isn't working is we're bringing in Bootstrap first, and we're not bringing in Bootstrap as, as a SAS file. So because I set this up previously, um, I've got to kind of undo something. So if I go to index.js, um, you'll remember that previously we brought in the CSS file for Bootstrap. Remember putting that there? You see line four? We have to get rid of that. We have to take that out. Because otherwise, nothing that we do is going to work. So, number one, get rid of Bootstrap. I'm going to get back to everything looking ugly. That's fine. Okay. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, inside of here, I'm going to actually import um, Bootstrap again. So, I need to actually go back here. Buh, 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 buh. Notes. That's the line I need. So the way that this kind of looks is we set some variables such as the colors, the font family. We're going to import Bootstrap like this, and then we can add additional rules down below. So that's kind of the structure of what our what our SAS file is going to look like. Set some variables, bring in Bootstrap. And then there. So this this here, this way of bringing in Bootstrap as that SAS file, is going to allow us to override those variables and bring that in. So I'm copy that over. So maybe red and green are primary and secondary. Bring in Bootstrap. 
add any additional roles that I might want. So going back, now now we're starting to see something, right? Then, well, how come how come we're not in net after our our own um, definition? How come how come uh, each reference doesn't overwrite us? doesn't overwrite us, doesn't change those variables. Yeah. So the way that Bootstrap is set up is it basically only sets those variables if they're not already set. So in Bootstrap, in all of this, in their SAS, they say, well, only set, only set primary if primary hasn't been set, basically. So I can overwrite primary up here, and then that will be used in the Bootstrap style sheet. Anywhere where they have a variable problem. Cool. So so I can start to change some of those colors. If I want to play with maybe the nav bars, um, that dark color, I could specify that maybe dark um, is maybe uh, some sort of light, lighter gray. So maybe C C C C and six C's there. And you can see the dark color on the nav bar has changed, right? So I can start to play around with all of the SAS variables once I've got the structure, right? It's just a matter of, of removing the old way we brought in the CSS and the new way we bring it in being here. Are we good with that? Okay, so let's look at some more variables. So um, I'm going to undo the dark. So I'm just doing primary and secondary because those are usually the, the first two I go in and change. Um, the other thing I may want to do is change some of the fonts in here. So if you look under utilities and with bootstrap documentation, um, you go to utilities text. Okay. Remember this is where all of our text styling and stuff is. There's a section down at the bottom called SAS. You can see it in the navigation on the right. So I'm going to click on SAS. It's going to scroll me down here. It's going to tell me about all of the variables that we have. So I'm going to link to that in Discord so you can get to the same place where I'm at. So they already have all of these variables in there. You can modify these to your hearts and content to get the base font styling the way that you want. So I might want it to be able to change the the base font. So there's a bunch of variables here. The one that we want to look at is font family base down here. That's the main one that we use to change the font everywhere. So let's say, let's say I want, for whatever reason, I want to change um, the font everywhere to be uh, Times New Roman. I can do that. So I would say font family base times new roman times new roman and this is serif there we go my website's all of a sudden in times new roman everywhere you can think about that. That actually could be any any font I want it to be. And, and one of the things I will want to do here before we get the days out is go pull a font from Google Fonts. So I'm going to go pull my own font. But we're starting to see how you can set these things up. Great. So you can get a lot out of just starting to change some of these variables. Just by changing primary, secondary, and font family base, you can do a lot. Okay. And again, looking through the Bootstrap documentation, you'll find these SAS variables all over the place. There are so many Bootstrap um, variables to configure different things. It's overwhelming in some sense. Okay. Um, and if you want to completely build a theme out yourself, you can do this. You can absolutely do this with the skills that you already have. Okay. Now, so the next thing I want to show you is a shortcut. Okay, um, I can set all these variables myself, but it's nice if maybe maybe I can pull an off-the-shelf solution. Maybe I can pull a solution that somebody else has already built, 
and use it, right? Because um, it turns out there's actually a bunch of themes that are already built and available online. And I can just, once I have the SAS stuff set up, I can just, they're just a drop in replacement. Okay, so there's a bunch of free themes, there's a bunch of paid themes. I'm going to show you uh, a library of some free things that you can use. So there's a website out there called uh, Bootswatch. Boot Swatch. Okay. As I say, free themes for Bootstrap. And, and they're a very, very easy drop in. They will already work with Bootstrap 5.1.3. Um, as I say, they're, they're easy to install and they're also very easy to customize. Okay. So go to this page. We're going to scroll down. And you're going to start to see that there's a preview of the different themes. Okay. So one of the things I want you to do, and, and you don't need to necessarily commit to a theme right now, but I want you to go look at the theme and pick one. Okay. So go through the themes and pick one. I will note um, one thing you can do. This is just a quick preview. This is just a, um, a an image screenshot. If you click on any of these screenshots, let's say I click on Lux, it's actually going to give us a full example of nearly every component in React. And so you can see how those things look with that theme applied. Okay, So you can preview them that way. And remember, we can still go back and, and change these. We can apply some variables on top. So go ahead. Take a, take a few minutes. Look through there, look through the options, and, and take a note of the one you're going to use. And we'll go and I'll show you how to install. Yes. I have a it over the weekend. So there's some there's some pretty cool things out there. A lot of things that will kind of drastically change how things look. Who's still looking for a theme? I think most people are kind of looks like they've landed on one. Okay, so um, take whatever theme you want from this point on. So we're at this point, our paths were diverge a little bit, okay? Because you may have a different theme than I'm following along with, um, and that means you you may run into different things. So I'm going to go with Quartz. That's the one we used over the weekend for the work ethic tracker as our baseline. And just to show you what this one looks like, um, basically it's designed to look a little bit like Frosted Class a little bit. So I'm going to be installing this package. Okay, so the steps to get this installed, let me go back to my notes. Where did my notes go? There. So we can preview it, we're going to pick a theme. In order to use it, we need to make sure we have three dependencies installed. Bootstrap 
which we've already installed. That still has to be installed. You can't uninstall it. You still need to bootstrap. You're also going to install Bootswatch and Node SAS. Okay. So we need all three of those things to do to make this work. So you're going to stop your server. You're going to install all of those three. And you can go ahead and just safely install install the three again, even though we've installed two of those already. So go ahead and make sure all three of those um, all three of those packages are installed. Once you get it installed, you're going to go on to step four, which is to modify your app SAS to look like this. And you'll notice there's a place in here where I'm using square bracket state, the name of your game. So if your name is if your name is quartz, you're going to put quartz here in both of these places that say uh, bracket. One thing to watch out when you bring in the name of the theme, the name of the theme is going to be called the little case size. So then some of those are panel case for the case. There you go. Size sheet. 
and then the other final is after. So it's sandwiched in between those two. You can add square brackets, so square brackets will be going there. And you're seeing it on that. Same if you want to say changes, you can do changes to that. Three spots, three crowns, three spots. 
with the stowage. So they're importing pillows before bootstrap and after bootstrap. So now you're trying to do that again. Install the map, just for the reason, install the process. So just to kind of call your attention to what happened is what you did, right? Um, you know, look at the three lines, you can see the cow the graph, that's what you're looking at. So you've got three lines, right? So you've got the middle line, which is what we just did, which is that's just feature. The middle one is just feature, that's the base, baseline feature. What they're adding in before and after is two additional files. So you can see this one's coming from Bootstrap, the one before and the one after are coming from the swatch package. Okay. That tell me basically says pull it from both modules so that you can think about it. So we say pull from Bootswatch, Bootswatch this theme with variables. So there's two for every theme for every theme there's two files. There's two SAS files. There's a variable SAS files and there's a Bootswatch SAS files. So this is basically, in this file, if you were to look in there, is a massive grid of all the variables that they're changing. And then the second file is all the additional rules, all the additional CSS rules that they're applying on top of both Bootstrap and those things, optimizations. The ones that are pretty generic, that are pretty close to boots, Bootstrap itself, are not going to have too much in the second file. But the ones that are very different are going to have a lot more in that second file. Um, and you could kind of think about it this way. If you weren't going to use a theme, you could completely do all that yourself. You just declare find the variables up here, and you define your additional roles, roles down at the bottom. And so that, A, first of all, it speeds things up because they've already done some of the work, but then we can further enhance it because we can still add additional roles down here. After that, and we can add additional variable customization over. Cool. All right. Uh, Michael, did that finish successfully yet? So you just won't be able to test it. So this means you won't know what you're doing. So we can we can we can try troubleshooting this at least at around so we can try to figure this out before. And then I'll I'll try to figure out what we need. Probably then we need to install some different things. Okay, so it might take an hour to sort of this out. Okay. So it's another thing that also is like, oh we need to work with Okay. So I'm going to bring in that quartz theme. I'm going to get caught up with where you're at, and then I'm going to play around with some of these rules. So I'm going to go here. <coughs> I wanted to get in. And replace that. And 
so what I want is quartz. And quartz, I think I still need to install Bootswatch. npm install Bootswatch. Now, one general recommendation, um, if you have additional CSS, additional custom CSS that you've already applied, so if you already have some CSS files, you might want to go ahead and comment that code out. Um, reason being, the code, that, the custom CSS that you wrote probably was largely tied to the default theme. So more than likely any custom CSS that you've already done you may have to go through and you're probably going to have to troubleshoot it. And so I would recommend if you have any CSS files right now, go ahead and comment out all the code that's in those files. I would recommend doing that. So that the only CSS that you're getting is from the theme, is from the theme and any classes that you've applied in your code. Okay, that will lead you to the least amount of conflicts. Not that you should throw that code away. A good amount of it will probably still work. It's just you'll have to put it back in piece by piece. Cool? So if you've got an index.css or an app.css or other things like that, um, you'll need to troubleshoot those things. Yeah? So Bootstrap does this weird thing where they put importance on their uh, styles when they yep. finally get processed. Yep. Is, does that still stay now that we're no longer importing the CSS files directly? That still stays. That hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. They'll still be doing important all the places that they used to be. Basically, remember when we brought this in before, we got a bootstrap.min CSS, right? But that was a pre-built version. That was a version of where we couldn't change any of the variables and we couldn't customize it really. We could add additional CSS after it, but we really couldn't customize what's in there. So this actually allows us to change internally how Bootstrap is working by changing those variables. So it actually lets us do a lot of things that we couldn't do um, without SAS. Okay, so one of those things I want to do is to kind of come up with a color palette. Okay, um, maybe I've maybe I pulled down this quartz theme, and, and maybe it's maybe it's good, but I probably want to go change it and make it something more personalized, more um, fitting myself fitting what I'm trying to do. So I might try, you know, just playing around with some colors. I might say, hey, let's just do primary. And I'm going to do primary red and uh, again, secondary green. And I'm going to I'm going to change this here again in a minute. Um, but I can start by just setting some of those things. If I come back, uh, we will we'll see anywhere that those primary and secondary colors are, have been used, it's going to change, right? So you've got some primary and secondary colors with the theme. Oftentimes that Bootswatch theme might not have the right color palette for your thing. So usually what I look at from the Bootswatch thing is I, I kind of look for something that has the right shapes and the right general look and feel that I want, but with the knowledge that I'm probably going to change the palette anyway, one way or the other. Okay. So that's as simple as this. Now, one thing you might notice here, um, you might notice that the background didn't change with my primary and secondary color change. So one thing that happens sometimes, sometimes the customizations that they do, sometimes they introduce the additional variables, and so there might be additional variables for your chosen theme that you can customize. Other times you may find that they've hard-coded in some 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 of their own CSS in that second part. So, and I think this is one of those things where we ended up kind of playing around with it and determining that well, we I wanted to change the background, so we, we needed to do that um, with our own rule. So, if I want to change the background, it might be a CSS variable, or it might be something like um, trying to figure out where it is. Uh, so, if I do an inspect. I can actually troubleshoot this one in particular, and I'll go up to body, 
and I can see on the body over there in the inspection tools that that's where the background is being applied, is being applied to the body. So I can just override that. Um, so I might do something like body is background. Was it back? Yeah, I think it was. Was it background image or background color? Um, do 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 do. It was background image. So background image. And so maybe I want to put my own linear gradient in there. And I could do something like 135 degree uh, white black. And so I'll get a different background in there um, pretty quickly, right? Uh, without trying to play around with too much, too much stuff. And, and so you're starting to see how this can kind of quickly, um, with a little bit of tweaking, um, hopefully you can see that it's going to become quite different. Now, coming up with a color palette in and of itself can be a bit of a daunting thing, right? So we need to come up with these colors. There's actually quite a few colors in Bootstrap, more than just primary and secondary. Remember, there's danger and, and etc. cetera. Um, and oftentimes I want to come up with colors that work well together. Okay, so there are some tools that we can use. There's one tool in particular that's really helpful for that. So over here, uh, I'll come back to Google Fonts. We'll do that second. Um, there's there's a website called Adobe Color. Um, if you go out to color.adobe.com, you'll get a color picker like this. Okay, go ahead and pull that up in your browser. And so what I want to do is, as far as us customizing our themes is we're going to go use this tool to generate, first of all, a palette, um, which we're going to use to fill in, um, to fill in the rest of it. Okay? So I get a palette of colors that we can use to figure this out. So color.adobe.com. There is a tour if you want to go through the tour, um, but I'm going to go ahead and jump out of here. Um, over on the left, um, you'll see that there are a whole bunch of different options. All of these options will kind of change how these circles move around as you drag them, and they can give you kind of some uh, Relation is there to help you get good relationships between your colors and good maybe complementary colors. So, for instance, here it's on analogous. Um, if I start to move things around, you'll kind of see how it kind of tries to keep things close within a certain range. This one that's got a little arrow on it, you see, behaves a little bit different. So I can use that to move things around and get to um, whatever palette I want to be. Okay. Um, other options you can get here, if you go to, say, complementary, it'll put it all on one axis. Um, if I go to things like triad, you'll see it gives you three, three different colors, basically, that are set at 128 degrees from each other. That can give you some interesting palettes. I think maybe this time I'm going to go through and do analogous. And so maybe I'll reset and kind of go back here and maybe choose, maybe I like some greens and some yellows, so I maybe move things around like this. Okay, so that's going to get you to some circles in, in different places around. Um, so I want you to do is kind of take one of those, any of these different modes, move it around to get to a palette that you like. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take these color codes here. There's hex codes for each of them. So we're going to take those five hex codes and we're going to bring them back to, uh, we're going to put those in some variables so we can use those in a minute. So find yourself a palette and then we're going to bring that into VS Code. Make sure you have your color for the thing that you're talking about. Because otherwise, you're not going to get the same color. What exactly was your calculation here? 
So what it's giving us is a set of So those are going to give us, those are, this is neuron analogous. So it's giving you colors that are kind of close together, that are similar. If you want to put colors that are very different, then if you want to do linear complementaries, they would be on opposite sides. There, you see how that's like, look at just really complementary. Or okay. just beyond more analysis. So you see we've got colors on this side, colors on that side, on one axis. And so you can spin it around, you can grab one color from this one. So you grab the individual colors. And so there we've got, like, okay, this axis is greens and purples. And you just kind of spin that around. So what axis is RGB? <laughs> Um, I mean, like so, red is at this, zero degrees. No, I, mean, I mean, like, back at peak. Yeah, like, they get RGB by just all these are red, green, and blue. Yes, yeah, that's a little bit of a difference. Not, not so much the color. Yes, yes, that's a big difference. So, anyway, the point is, you want to pick one of those nodes, um, and get yes. powerful, and get a copy. Okay. So, what you're going to do is just get it to a point like it. Checking in with everybody here. Okay. Keep on that. One thing you want to do is bring some of these noms in so that they're not, you see there's actually five colors. Mm -hmm. So you want to bring those in because right now you had it, had it stretched out. You want to bring some of those in so you actually have five colors, not just. I don't know where your other color is. You should have five knots. Yeah, yeah, I'll each other. So you want to make sure you actually have one that are the So I'm going back here. What you want to end up with is actually five distinct colors, not any of them. Otherwise, you have a smaller color. You actually want five distinct colors. Cool. Do you have a palette? Do you have a palette? So, just so we're clear, like that palette doesn't have to be perfect, and, and you can come back and tweak it later. Um, so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these five color values, and I'm going to bring them into variables in SAS. So, take color number one. And I'm going to just put this into a variable up top. Um, palette. I'm just coming up with these names. So palette one, palette two, I'm just pulling in the colors one by one. Um, the reason I'm going ahead and pulling them all in this way and not directly setting primary or secondary is that makes it easier for me to come back and tweak things as I need to. Um, if I just put them directly into primary and secondary, then I have to keep going back to coloradobe.com and, um, and, and moving things around there. So now that I've got that, I've got those pal that palette back here, what I'm going to start doing is associating the colors in my palette 
with like the primary and the secondary colors and things like that. So I might say, okay, this is palette one is here, and maybe I'll do palette five is my secondary color. You know, pick two colors from the palette, and those are going to be my my primary and my secondary. Um, I can also play around with my gradient. And so maybe in my gradient, I go from one of the uh, one of the two palette colors. Maybe I go from uh, this to two. Or sorry, to five. And that can kind of give me a start to that gradient. Now, I think maybe I want my, my primary to be a little bit brighter. I think I can do... Nope, I can't. I can't do that. So maybe... Maybe, and maybe I need it to be offset a little bit. So I have a problem here that I have kind of a, I, I have a, an interesting palette, but I need some additional colors because um, those don't, I don't have something that contrasts really well with the secondary and the primary. So I'm going to actually go back to there. I'm actually going to pick out some additional colors because that analogous is too too close. So I'm actually going to go to triad and I'm going to start with the first color here, that palette one. Um, what I want to find is some colors that are on the opposite end. So I'm going to take the green handle, move it to where mine is, and so then it's giving me the analogous colors would be over in the purples, or sorry, uh, opposite colors would be over there in the purples, and so maybe I'll do, maybe I'll do that. Do a purple, and an orange, and something like that there. So I might need to add some additional colors oftentimes. So that's going to be um, palette I'm going to call that six because I need some additional colors and I'm going to take this one and call that seven. Just to try and get some more contrasting colors. And so maybe, maybe I can make this six and that seven. There we go. Huh? Pretty nice. Yeah, so we can get a lot. We can get a lot of mileage just by kind of tweaking some of these things, um, and you know, starting with the beginning and then and then pulling in a palette. Okay. So that's a very good touch, right? If you just say, let's start with a palette from Adobe. It's that's going to be a really good start, um, and then we also want to oftentimes change the font. Okay, is usually the very next thing I want to go play around with. So I'm going to try and do that. Um, I'm going to go to uh, google.com. Now, this is something I haven't had a chance to test this morning, so we'll see um, if I can get it working. Sometimes I've had problems with getting the combination of SAS and fonts and um, React and all of that to play nice with each other in Webpack. So um, hopefully we won't have too much trouble here. Um, so if you go to uh, google.fonts.com, um, this is a huge library of what we call royalty-free fonts. Like you don't have to pay anybody to use them. Um, 
be forewarned that there's a lot of fonts online and a lot of them are not free. In fact, they some of them are very expensive. Okay, and some of them you may get charged for every user that views that you use that page kind of thing or every page view. So do be careful about just randomly getting fonts from out from there. So font, Google Fonts is the safe place. These have been kind of designed and they're they're proven to work on on browsers. Okay. So uh, interesting. Redacted. Okay. So I'm going to go out here, and what I'm going to try and do is pick a font that I like. And you should pick a font that works well with your design, too. Um, the one I'm going to go ahead and go with, I'll, I'll say, is um, Oswald. I think I've had pretty good luck with. So um, that's the one I'm going to be using. But, but definitely take a look at the ones that are available and, and find one that you feel like looks good. What I usually end up doing is I have one font for my headers and a different font for the body text. So because the, the header ones, you really want them to stand out pretty well versus the font that you use in the body, you may not want it to stand out as much. Okay. So go ahead and take a look at the fonts. What I want you to do is find one that you're going to use for headers. <laughs> so, yeah, either, either monospace or, or, or sans serif is usually a pretty common. So, in those two spaces is usually a good place to go. There's some good display fonts too. I would just do the ones that are part of the region. So I'm going to switch back. I want to probably write A normal. You know what? I want to probably write the letter A normal. <laughs> and then I'll take the, the A and the letter A and the letter A and the letter A. Yeah, look at how I've gone.
So, Don, I know you're not at this point, and you do watch it now. So, once we've picked a font, you should be on this page. Um, you should have the name of your font up here, and you're going to have a few different styles. Okay. Um, if you click on Download Family, that's going to download all of the different styles that are on here. Usually, we don't need all of them. Usually we just need some of them. So what we want to do is just pick the ones we want. And typically the one you want is going to be regular 400. So in this case, there's one for every different weight. I'm going to just pick 400. That's going to be my base weight. For them. You can start with other ones. You can start with higher weights um, if you want it to be more bold out of the box, but usually 400 is a good starting point because that's the that's the one that the font creator is meant for them to be the starting point. They meant for 400 to be your starting point. So I'm just going to select that one. Okay. So when I say it, select that style, it's going to pop up a sidebar and you can see that there's some, some things, right? So like there's a link and you'll also notice that there's an import. So I could, if I wasn't going to download this, I do believe that I could use that import in the SAS. I do believe that you can use that import in the SAS. Um, the problem with that is that fonts do take a good amount of time to load. They're pretty big. And my experience has been it's usually better to go ahead and download the file. That's a fine. So, I'm going to go ahead and actually download this file and include it with me. Okay, so download all. That's going to download all the styles that I've selected. Um, you'll see here I've got an Oswald.zip. I'm going to go to Show in Folder. That's here. And so if we look at what's inside of that zip file that I just downloaded, there's a few different things there. Um, you'll notice that there's like a static. You'll notice that there's an OFL. You'll notice that there's a TTF file. There's a readme. Depending on the particular font you downloaded, you may have other files there. Now, the main one that we need really is just this TTF here. Uh, and this one actually is, you see, variable font weight. This one's actually, because it's variable, actually functions as all of those different weights. So actually, that completely takes care of 400 and 500, etc. Okay, so that's the only one. Um, generally speaking, you do want to keep a hold of the other files in, in here. Um, the other, some of the other files are important, namely the OFL stands for Open File License. This is your copyright information. You don't want to lose that. So not only do we want to bring down the uh, we don't want to just keep that TATF. We also need to keep the copyright notice. Everybody good with that? Okay. So what I'm going to do, before I can bring this into VS Code, I do need to unzip it. So I'm going to right-click, 7-zip, or right-click, um, extract all. You should have that extract all button, I think. Or you may have... Um, 
you may have something of that sort. But either way, we need to extract everything that's there. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring that off to the side. And I'm only going to bring in the files that I need, but I'm going to put them in a specific place. So first things first, um, I do believe these files need to go into source, not public. So under source, I'm going to create a new folder, call it fonts. And then under fonts, I'm going to create another folder, and I'm going to name that according to the font that I just pulled down, which is Oswald. So this is a weird case where I am going to do camel case. I don't usually do camel case in my file names, but I usually find it helpful with fonts. So fonts Oswald. I'm going to go ahead and take just those three and bring it in and skip the static because the static files are pretty big. So under Oswald or whatever your font name is, if it's XYZ, you'll have fonts XYZ. I'm going to bring that in. Now, um, if you're not using the import, if you're not using the import, um, that import kind of has um, some stuff built in. So one thing I want to do real quick is I'm going to go back to Google Fonts and I'm going to show you something. So over on the Google Fonts, and again, this will be a little bit different depending on your font. Uh, when it's importing, what it's actually importing is a CSS file, not a font. So there's a bit of indirection happening. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and open up that URL just so you can see what that's returning. So the import that they give you is actually a style sheet. Okay, In that style sheet, you'll see that there's a bunch of these font faces, a bunch of these font face tags. So these font face, um, these font face rules are necessary for you to use your own TTF files, right? If you have a TTF file that you got from Google Fonts or somewhere else, uh, you'll have to specify how to use that TTF file. This is what does that. These font face variables are what takes care of that. Okay. Um, so you'll notice there's a few things here. You'll see that there's um, Actually, let me move it over a little bit because I think it's going off the projector. Um, so it almost looks a little bit like a media query. Let's see if I can get to Latin. So Latin, we've got inside the font face, we have a few properties. We have font family, font style, font weight, font display, and then the source. Okay. Now that source is going to look a little bit different for us because we're pulling it from a local file. But we still have to add in this font face thing. Everybody there with me? Cool. So I'm going to have to kind of duplicate this, um, this file because we're downloading it directly. I'm going to have to do part of this setup myself. So again, this is going to look a little bit different based on the font that you have. But it should look something like this. should look something like that role. Um, I'm going to move this over here and so I'm actually going to do this maybe here at font dash face um, I'm going to say let's bring in uh, font family and that will be the name of the font that you downloaded so for me, I downloaded Oswald. Um, regardless of the font that you pulled down, the font style should be normal to start with, more than likely. Uh, normal, if you followed my directions to pull down font, um, font weight 400, you should also have that as four, 400. Um, it's worth noting if it is a variable font, that is going to be 400 regardless of what you what you set it. Okay. Uh, font display. Font display is an interesting one. I would recommend just keeping that as swap. 
Um, font display tells it how to how it will change or how it will deal with the font not being initially loaded. So there's a bunch of different options here that will change how your website behaves. One of these options, um, which is not swap, is that the page just stays white and doesn't show the user anything until the font is loaded. Like that is an option. Okay. Swap says use something else until we get the font and then swap it and re-render the page once the font gets loaded. So with this, we're intentionally we're setting it up so that they're initially going to be able to see the content and then initially and then once the font loads, it's going to pop and be in the new font. Is everybody clear with that? So I'm actually doing that intentionally because it's usually the best, uh, that usually gets you the best experience, is go ahead and accept that that pop. But we just have to be aware that that pop is going to happen. Uh, the next thing here is I need to say URL. Okay, now the URL is one of the harder parts to get kind of figured out. Um, what the URL is going to be is it's going to be a relative path to where the file is. Because we downloaded it, it won't be like an HTTP URL. It'll be relative to where we're at. And so I believe that where I put it is starting at the same directory. Um, I think, oh, I need to do source, source colon, is URL, I think it's down to fonts, Oswald. And there's the one I want. So you should have something like this, okay? Now that's not actually going to make it use that font. That's just enough so that it knows that the font exists. That's going to cause it to download the file and then have it ready so you can use the word Oswald somewhere else, okay? So now that I've got this, I'm going to actually declare the variable that's going to use it. So here I might say something like at uh, a dollar sign. Let me see one thing on the bootstrap docs because I forget how they've changed this. Um, for the H1s. Okay, so I'm still going to have to do that manually. Okay. So uh, font family base, remember, is going to change the font everywhere. So if I do that, font family, what? So With the new font? Yeah. So what we say is use that new name, Oswald, and then I have to have a fallback, and that fallback is not going to be necessarily the same thing for everybody. Um, so if you're starting with, if what you're trying to show is a serif font, you should be using serif, something like Times New Roman. This fallback should be serif. If it's more like Arial, um, then it'd be sans serif. If you're starting, if this is a monospace font, then you should fall back to monospace. Okay. So when your fallback's going to be based on what kind of font you pulled down. So pull that there. You terminal. I think I'm still running. Let's see how that looks. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So just with a little bit of work, trying to get it set up. Um, yeah, fonts are usually a, a pretty big impact. Yeah, I really like Oswald in there. So about this swap thing, yeah. Do you indicate uh, swap or specify like, uh, a category of font that would be called for fallback? So you're specifying like swap. So you're saying not specifying them. Um, then it would be whatever the browser default, which is usually the same. So fallback to monospace, because you're using monospace. This is the 
to just picking the one font, um, I'll go back to uh, Google Fonts and I'll usually pick a second font. So um, where where did I lose it? I've got so many tabs open right now. Uh, back. There we go. So Google Fonts is where I want to be. Um, it used to be that they gave you comparisons and gave you suggested fonts, but I didn't see that. It's, it seems like a feature that's been removed. Um, so what I oftentimes want to do is pick a font that goes with it um, that I can use as a regular body font. So um, top, pick, top picks of things that I oftentimes use as a regular font, you want to use something very plain. Um, oftentimes Open Sans or Roboto, um, both of these are really good starting points. Um, Lado is also one that's that's a decent starting point, and things like that. So you want for Noto Sans works too. Um, you generally want something that's very simple. So I'm going to go with with Open Sans, and so I'm going to download that as well. So select this style, and just like I did with the other one. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and download Open Sans as well. So Open Sans, boop, go to Downloads, extract that again. Okay, Open Sans, and I'm going to create a folder again. I need so under Fonts, I'm going to create a new folder. And this is open underscore sans. And I'm going to bring in again everything except the um, the static folder. So now I've got two fonts in there. Okay. So I need another font face. So I've got Oswald and I've got open sans. I'm going to load my default one first so that it, it's there sooner. Or maybe I maybe I'll load it second. I'll load that one second. Open Sans, and this is going to be here a different path. Everything else should be the same. Open Sans. There. So I've got two of these. Um, Unfortunately, that's got a comma in it. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. So, all right. So we got those two fonts in, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Open Sans here as the default. Okay. That's going to get it back to a pretty normal font. And then I'm going to go add another variable. And that's where I'm going to use Oswald. So I've got two variables defined. One is the base. One is for the headers. Okay, that's oftentimes how I set this up. So this one, this one is a bootstrap recognized variables. This one is not. This is just a name I've come up with. Font family header isn't supported. So 
um, if I if I refresh, I'm still gonna not going to see that Oswald header. So what I oftentimes have to do is that same trick that we saw before, where I might set some variables up top and then add some additional CSS at the end. So at the end of this, I'm going to add in h1, h2, h3, h4, h5. Yes, I'm writing all the h's out. And I'm going to say that those are all um, font family dollar sign font family header. So I'm going to code that in that way. Just manually hooking it up. In that way, that way I can have a different header font um, for all of those. Oftentimes I'll find that I want um, other things that look like headers but aren't actually headers. Um, so I may do dot fs1 uh, dot fs2 etc huh yeah is basically a header too so I, I kind of want those to have the same style so oftentimes I'll do that to make all my headers um, have a different styling from the rest. So I've got two variables up there and that's down here. So that's kind of how I play around with the fonts. Um, I'm gonna, I think this is a good point to kind of stop my, my lecture, my coverage for today. Um, what I'm going to do is just check in with everybody that you got this far um, and, and, and see where everybody's out there. Um, one of the things I didn't talk about yet is React icons. I think I'm just going to do that, cover that tomorrow because we've already talked about kind of not for today. So we'll talk about React. We'll talk about React icons tomorrow. Is that different from what I was using? Yeah, it's a little bit. It's a little bit different. It's an easy. It should be an easy. Yeah, they're they're font some icon. Yeah, it's it's similar but slightly different. So we should be able to convert without too much difficulty. I hope. We'll walk through that. I'll walk through that with you specifically. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and commit what I have here. Um, so again, I'm going to check in with everybody that um, you've got that.